Chapter 16 Lift Off The hangar roof was already open to the luminous dawn sky. There were virtually no clouds, and the wind was light. Tobias, Shepard, and I were overseeing the final cargo, double-checking our lists to make sure nothing had been left out and nothing unidentified got on. General Lancaster's men were out in full force, inspecting everything inside and outside the ship. I was glad of my uniform, for it made me look more confident than I felt. The uniform was armor. Near the gangway, Chef Lad was loudly complaining to a soldier about the way he was loading the food. Mr. Lunardi came over to soothe the volatile chef, while Captain Walken and Dr. Turgenev made their final inspection of the Star Climber's exterior. Miss Carr was busily setting up her camera equipment near the gangway, Haiku leaping about excitedly on her shoulder. Kate and Sir Hugh were arguing about whether to bring a large specimen cage. We're ready to board, Captain Walken finally announced. This is a great moment, said Mr. Lunardi. To my brave astronauts and our illustrious passengers, I wish you a glorious and safe journey. Godspeed! As everyone filed up the gangway, Miss Carr's camera flashed again and again, commemorating the occasion. History in the making, she said, though I thought there was a hint of mischief in her voice. It reminds me of those glorious images of people boarding the Titanica. Come on, Miss Carr, the captain said genially. I won't hear such superstitious stuff aboard my ship. I think we have enough photos now, don't you? Let me help you with your tripod, and let's get you settled on B-deck. I was the last aboard, for it was my duty to shut the main hatch. I heaved the great circular door closed on its vast hinges, and it locked snugly. All sounds of the outside disappeared abruptly. The noise of the ground crew in the hangar, the bird song, the powerful crash of the surf through the open roof. It was like putting the space helmet over my head that very first time, and I felt a sudden flare of panic. I'd just been cut off from the world. I could see it through the porthole, could see Mr. Lunardi giving me the thumbs up before walking off to the radio room. But the world was somehow no longer mine. I wouldn't see it again, or breathe its air, until we returned to harbor in three weeks. If we returned at all. I thought of the mysterious lights. I thought of ticking crates in our cargo hold. I took several deep breaths and looked across the rack that held our four spacesuits. Across the chest of each was stitched a name. Walken. Shepard. Blanchard. Cruz. I touched my suit. Had it not been for a split second of foolishness, it would have been Bronfman's name on it. If you're ready, Mr. Cruz, we've got a ship to take airborne. I turned to see Captain Walken waiting for me in the airlock doorway, smiling. Yes, sir. I'm delighted to have you on my crew again, Mr. Cruz, he said, and his simple words reassured me greatly. For years, I dreamed of serving under his command again, and here I was, a second officer on the first voyage to the stars. Together, we climbed the spiral staircase, past B-deck and A-deck, to the glass-domed bridge atop the ship. Shepard and Tobias were already buckled up in their seats, going through their checklists. I took my position. Check all hatches, please, said the captain. All hatches closed, I confirmed, looking at the indicator lights on my panel. We are airtight. Battery, Captain Walken said. I saw Tobias check his vault meter. We have a full charge, sir. Through the Star Climber's motors were constantly supplied with electricity from the ground, the ship also had a large backup battery, which held enough power for six hours. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. Start the ventilation system, please, Mr. Shepard. It was a pleasure to be under Captain Walken's command once again. I'd never forgotten his calm authority at the helm, nor his unflagging politeness. My ears popped as the air pumps pressurized the Star Climber's interior. Even though we were rising to heights that might have had no air at all and virtually no pressure, 
we'd be kept comfortable inside. On Shepherd's console to my right, a sequence of green lights flared, telling us that the proper mix of oxygen and nitrogen was being fed through the air ducts. Dr. Turgenev's team had devised an ingenious ventilation system using liquid oxygen. Stored in special tanks, it took up much less space than gas, and was enough to last us three weeks. We are fully pressurized, sir, said Shepard. If he secretly felt that he should have been captain, he was doing an excellent job of hiding it. Air scrubbers, asked Captain Walken. We breathed in oxygen, but we exhaled carbon dioxide, and if there was too much of that, our air would be poisoned. They'd come up with a lithium hydroxide filter system that removed the carbon from the air and recirculated the oxygen. Filters are functioning, sir. Engine temperature, Mr. Cruz. The numerous motors that controlled the ship's rollers had already been activated and were warming up. I checked the row of gauges. All motors are primed, sir. Emergency descent system, please, said the captain. Built into the ship's hull near the bow were two hydrium balloons that could be rapidly inflated in case our rollers failed on descent. Explosive bolts charged and hydrium pressure is optimum, reported Shepard. Thank you. Mr. Blanchard, would you test the radio? As incredible as it sounded, we'd be able to communicate with ground station even when we were 25,000 miles away. The astral cable was our antenna. Transmitter and receiver working just fine, said Tobias, a set of earphones over his head. And we have radio contact with ground station. Star climber, came Mr. Lunardi's familiar voice over a speaker. Do you read me? We read you, ground station, said Tobias. Please tell Mr. Lunardi we are airtight, pressurized, and fully charged, said Captain Walken, and Tobias relayed the message. Excellent. You are clear for liftoff, Star Climber, said Mr. Lunardi. Mr. Cruz, engage the rollers, please, said Captain Walken. I took hold of a large lever, pulled it hard toward me, and locked it. Above the dome, I saw the flexed spider legs quiver slightly as they tightened their grip on the cable. And I knew that all the rollers within the ship had also taken hold. I felt a small but eager vibration pass through the Star Climber's frame, and my body too, for I was straining for the takeoff. My pulse raced. Captain Walken looked overhead to confirm that the hangar roof was fully open, and then, with a simple nod of his head, said, All ahead dead slow, Mr. Shepard. I glanced over at Shepard enviously. He was first officer, and he had the privilege of guiding the world's first spaceship out of harbor on her maiden voyage. All ahead dead slow, sir, Shepard said, easing the throttle forward. Behind me, within the cable shaft, the ship's rollers hummed as they began to turn. With scarcely a shudder, the star climb removed. We were rising! Until this moment, there had always been some small part of me that didn't quite believe it would work. How could it? You couldn't dangle a thread from outer space and just climb it. There was nothing holding it up. No steel trusses, no bolts. It simply wasn't possible. Yet, it was possible. And we lifted. We rose up through the hangar and into the sky. Out of the panoramic windows, I saw the tops of the tallest palms drop away. There was the coast and the water ablaze with the rising sun. The Pacificus stretched to all horizons. We're aloft! Tobias cried into the radio. Round station, we are aloft! We see that star climber, returned Mr. Lunardi, and even over the speaker I could hear his voice was hoarse with emotion. We see you, and you are a beautiful sight to be sure! I watched the altimeter and saw the needle climbing. 100 feet. 110. 120. The noise of the rollers filled the bridge like the reassuring thrum of airship engines. Yet it only emphasized the strangeness of this utterly new form of flight. It feels so odd, I said, to be moving up without moving forward. It is uncanny, Captain Watkins said. I keep waiting to slide back down, said Tobias. 
but the roller's grip was true, for there was absolutely no sensation of slippage. There was virtually no sway to the ship either. All its movement was vertical. Up was its only direction and desire. Two hundred feet. Two fifty. Three hundred. A pair of Aeroforce ornithopters circled us from a distance, and beyond them I saw the General's airship hovering, keeping watch. We were still rising no faster than an elevator, but I smiled and smiled. It was an amazing feeling. Five hundred feet, sir, I said, checking the altimeter. The captain nodded. Throttle back, Mr. Shepard, please. He gradually brought the star climber to a full stop, and we hung there on our astral cable. I must say it made me feel strange all over, because I'd never been utterly motionless in the sky like this. It seemed to defy every natural law. I couldn't help peering out the windows to make sure we weren't falling. Round station, this is Star Climber, Tobias said into the radio. We're stationary at 500 feet and awaiting further orders. Star Climber, you look grand from here, said Lunardi. Run another complete check and report back, please. Once more, the four of us went methodically through all the ship's systems to make sure they were working properly. Everything's fine up here, ground station, Tobias radioed. Excellent. You're clear to continue your climb, Star Climber. Report back when you've reached ten miles, please. Full ahead one-third, please, Mr. Shepard, Captain Watkins said. Shepard set the ship in motion once more. The pitch of the engines increased. We'd taken her out of harbor dead slow, but now I felt a slight weight in my stomach as we picked up speed. We're at 40 aeronauts, sir, I reported. Make turns for 80, Mr. Shepard, the captain said. I marveled that Shepard could look so composed as he pushed the throttle forward and we shot upward. The heaviness in my stomach intensified. Outside the windows, the ornithopters fell out of sight as though they had been yanked down with strings. We were now going as fast as an airship, only straight up. The captain grinned. Let's give her a workout, Mr. Shepard. Take her to full speed. Full ahead, sir. As Shepard pushed the throttle almost to its furthest point, I felt my body push down hard against my seat. 120 aeronauts, sir, I said. Fast enough for you, Shepard? asked Tobias. I've been faster, he said, nodding out the window at the two ornithopters that had caught up with us and were swooping around the cable. But Shepard had a smile on his lips, and I could tell he was actually enjoying himself. Those fellows won't be able to keep up for long, said the captain with a chuckle, for sky sailors tended to think ornithopters an inferior form of flying. We're climbing at over 10,000 feet a minute. Sure enough, the ornithopters, after one last flapping surge, sank swiftly below us. Shepard watched them go. Come on, Shepard, admit it, Tobias said. You're impressed. It's an impressive machine, he said. Just isn't my idea of flying. My granny could fly this thing. Maybe we should have brought her then, said Tobias. I bit back my laughter. I didn't want to appear unprofessional, right now of all times. Well done, gentlemen, said the captain. A smoother first launch I couldn't imagine. We're on our way to the stars. At our current speed, we should reach Cable's End in eight days. It was amazing how quickly the sensation of speed disappeared. Apart from a slight heaviness in the stomach, you could almost forget you were hurtling through the sky at great speed. The captain turned to me. Mr. Cruz, why don't you go below and see how our passengers are faring? Yes, sir. Now that the star climber was underway, it needed a crew of only two on the bridge, and we'd be beginning our shift soon. I started down the spiral staircase. The ship was remarkably steady. There was hardly any of the rocking or pitching of an airship. My footsteps felt a bit leaden with gravity's drag, but my spirits were lighter than air. Nothing could match the delicious feeling of setting sail on a long voyage. I passed a deck, which was entirely taken up with our sleeping quarters and a single lavatory. I'd be sharing a cabin with Tobias. It was certainly small, but no more cramped than crew quarters aboard the Aurora. There were two bunks, each fitted with restraining straps, for when gravity failed us, and a chest of drawers for our belongings, and that was it. The porthole was large, mercifully. 
As I continued down to B deck, I could hear the sounds of Chef Vlad already at work in his kitchen. Pots clanged, a knife whacked against the cutting board, a whisk scratched against a metal mixing bowl, and Chef Vlad was muttering ominously to himself in Transylvanian. It was just like old times aboard the Aurora. The Star Climber was properly coming to life. B deck was the largest of the ship's levels, for the Star Climber was widest amidships. Apart from the kitchen, adjoining pantry, and lavatory, which had all been built in a semicircle around the central shaft, B deck was a wide open area, lounge, dining room, and observation deck combined. Floor to ceiling windows were generously spaced along the curving hull, letting in dazzling sunlight and a sweeping view of the Pacificus. Kit was already on her feet, field glasses around her neck, and nose pressed against the reinforced glass, gazing out in wonder. Miss Carr was examining the numerous cameras that had been mounted on tripods all around the deck, so she could take pictures of virtually anything outside the ship. Haiku leapt about excitedly, chittering at Vice. Dr. Turgenev was nowhere to be seen, so I assumed he must already be below on sea deck in the laboratory, using his complicated machinery to test the atmosphere as we climbed. Sir Hugh was the only one sitting, turned away from the windows, and writing busily. Mr. Lunardi certainly hadn't spared any expense on the ship's furnishings. There were leather armchairs and ornate tables, and velvet sofas and shaded reading lamps. A hand-painted mural of the solar system adorned the walls between windows. At first glance, the room didn't look very different from the first-class lounges on his luxury airships. But every stick of furniture was bolted to the metal floor, and all the chairs and sofas were fitted with restraining belts. Spaced all across the deck, walls, and ceiling were hand and footholds, so we'd be able to move about more easily when we were weightless. How's everyone feeling? I asked. It's incredible, said Kate. I was a bit woozy just at the very beginning, but I'm fine now. How fast are we going, Mr. Cruz? 120 aeronauts, Miss DeVry. I pointed at the odometer mounted on a nearby bulkhead, and that tells us the distance we've traveled. Almost four miles already, Kate said. That's more than 20,000 feet. Sir Hugh looked up at this, and I thought his brow seemed a bit shiny. He quickly looked back down at his papers. In an airship, such a swift ascent would have left us gasping on the floor. But here, in our pressurized, heated star climber, we noticed no changes at all. I looked at Kate, field glasses to her eyes, scanning the sky. I'd hardly seen her this past week, and I longed for her touch. Even the brush of her fingertips against mine would be enough. But there was no chance of that here. With a sigh, she lowered her field glasses and moved to another window. I just don't understand why I haven't seen one by now. I knew she'd been hoping to sight a cloud cat to prove to Sir Hugh they existed once and for all. Maybe it's the wrong time of year, Miss DeVry, I said. I've become quite used to calling her Miss DeVry. It was September when we saw them, remember? You're not still fretting over your flying cats, are you? Said Sir Hugh from his armchair. Kate's eyes narrowed. Sorry to disturb you, Sir Hugh. I thought you were napping. Not napping, Miss DeVry. Writing. I'm working on a scientific article refuting all this nonsense about mysterious life in our skies. Surely you should wait a while, Sir Hugh, said Kate. I've seen all there is to see in the skies, believe me. Maybe they're frightened of the cable or the ship, I said, hoping to head off any angry words between them. When my grandfather first sighted them, they weren't frightened of his balloon, Kate replied. Or the Aurora. They're curious. They'd be drawn to us. Who's to say they haven't cleared off, I said. There's been an awful lot of activity around here over the last couple of years. Machinery and noise and rockets. I didn't realize we'd be going so fast, Kate said irritably. I need more time. Can't you ask the captain to slow down? We're bound for outer space, Miss DeVry, I said firmly, practicing my own aloofness. It was never Mr. Lunardi's intent to linger down here. She looked at me as if she weren't quite sure whether I was play-acting. I felt pleased at her discomfort. Let her see what it's like to feel bewildered and uncertain. Smiling to myself, I went to another window. If I gazed straight down, I could just make out Ground Station, a series of gray rectangles amid the island's startling green. 
The coastline was outlined by a beautiful turquoise. Farther away, the water became darker and darker blue until it was almost inky. The star climber was approaching a bank of cumulus cloud, and I was looking forward to going through it. For a few moments, the windows were enveloped in white mist, brilliant with the sun's light above. Our ship gave a little shudder, then broke through into open sky. Stop the ship, Kate said suddenly. What's wrong, said Sir Hugh. I see one, said Kate, staring through her field glasses. Please, stop the ship. One what, said Miss Carr. A cloud cat. You're sure, I asked. Yes, yes. I went to the ship's phone and lifted it to my mouth. Crew's here. Request we stop ship. Miss DeVry has made a sighting. One moment, Matt, came Tobias's voice from the other end, and I could hear him conferring with Captain Walken. It'll take us a bit to make a full stop. Stand by. Through my feet and legs, I felt the ship slow, and within 30 seconds, we'd come to a complete stop. I checked the odometer. Just a shade under six miles. Everyone was crowded out around the windows now. Miss Carr and Sir Hugh. Even Dr. Turgenev had limped up from his laboratory to see what was going on. Sir Hugh had his own pair of field glasses around his neck. He didn't seem too steady on his feet, and I could tell he didn't like looking out the window. He dabbed his forehead with his handkerchief and cleared his throat. Is that it? said Miss Carr, pointing. I spotted it too, a distant silhouette of wings against the cloud. It's coming closer! It's huge! It's just like my grandfather described! Kate said triumphantly. He thought they were birds, but when he drew closer... Miss Carr, is your camera ready? I'm always ready, snapped Miss Carr, quickly positioning one of her cameras and peering through the viewfinder. It should pass right by us, said Kate breathlessly. Take as many pictures as you can. Sir Hugh, I think you'll find this exceedingly interesting. An electric tingle worked its way down my back. I remember the first incredible time I beheld one of these creatures on board the Aurora. They seemed impossible, part bird, part panther, as dangerous as they were beautiful. With my naked eye, I could still see only its silhouette against the bright sky. Miss Carr took one picture, then another. Wonderful, said Sir Hugh, peering through his field glasses. You see it? Kate said, delighted. Very clearly, he said. It's a wonderful whooper swan. What? Kate seized her own binoculars and stared. Take a good long look, my dear, said Sir Hugh. I think you'll find your cloud cat has feathers and a rather prominent bill. As Kate stared, all the rest of us strained to see the winged creature as it passed within 50 feet of us. I exhaled. It was indeed a very large swan. Unusual to see them so far out over the sea, said Sir Hugh smugly, but not unheard of. They're high flyers, too. However, 29,000 feet is certainly the highest altitude I've heard recorded. I shall write a note for the Royal Zoological Journal. Sorry for the false alarm, everyone, said Kate with admirable composure. You see, my dear, Sir Hugh said, it's not enough just to see something once. One has to look again and again to be sure. That's good science. Kate said nothing, her face rigid, her cheeks so red you might have fried an egg on it. I felt a wrenching sympathy for her, but I couldn't do anything to comfort her without seeming too familiar. I went to the ship's phone. Crew's here. It was a whooper swan. I heard Tobias chuckle. All right, thanks, Matt. Let us know if you see any buggies or woodpeckers. With scarcely a shudder, the star climber resumed its silken ascent, accelerating into the sky. We all stayed at the windows, even Sir Hugh, staring out in amazement, for the view seemed to change by the second. You can see the curve of Earth now, said Miss Carr. Sure enough, the blue horizon of the Pacificus was starting to slope gently away on either side. I checked the odometer. Seven miles, I said. No one's ever been this high. And no one's ever seen a view like this, murmured Miss Carr, taking several pictures. Our speed was mind-boggling. Every 30 seconds, we were another mile higher. Our island became smaller and smaller. The upper dome of the sky began to lose its color, the blue giving way to whiteness. Stars, Kate said, pointing. Beyond the gauzy veil of the morning sky, I could just make out the pinpricks of stars. They became brighter with every breath I took. 
Then before my eyes, the upper sky began to dissolve into darkness. It was as though we'd stolen into night and left Earth still in daylight. Below the bright blue curve of the ocean and above the stars beckoning us toward outer space.